Welcome back to the Exotic Pet Collective. A terrible podcast by Tarantula Collective. My name is Richard, I am your host, and today we have got a very interesting show for you. In fact, while listening back to this conversation while editing the podcast, I found it as interesting as I did when I was actually in the conversation. So I really think you're going to enjoy this. My guest today is Becky Hansis O'Neill. She is a PhD student in Missouri that's studying tarantulas, focusing mainly on their ability to learn, their memory, and their behaviors. It's a very fascinating conversation. I know you're really going to want to listen to this. If you're listening to the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcast or anywhere that you get the audio versions, this is going to be just a normal season three of the podcast. Nothing new. But if you are watching on YouTube, I'm doing something a little different. Initially, when I started the podcast, I set up a second channel, the Exotic Pet Collective, which is still there. You, you can go subscribe to that if you'd like. And I put all of the podcast on there because at the time, that was the suggested way of handling a podcast on YouTube. You didn't want to put it on your main channel because it wouldn't get views and, and overall it would hurt the analytics of the channel. But since the last episode of the podcast last year, there's been some major changes at YouTube. They now have a whole section on everyone's channel just for podcasts. So I can up the podcast on my main channel and it will be available to play on YouTube music but may also get suggested to people that enjoy my shorts or just follow for the long form content and people that just enjoy the podcast might get some recommendations for my normal videos or even the shorts so hopefully it'll all kind of work together so I'm going to try posting a couple of podcasts on this main channel here on YouTube and see how it goes but it's great to be back and I really hope you enjoy this podcast I can't wait to bring in on Becky she is going to talk about a, a post that she made recently on Facebook that kind of caught my attention. I thought it was very fascinating because it's something that we talk about a lot in the tarantula hobby. And not just talk about, like, it gets some pretty passionate arguments going from time to time. So I wanted to bring her on, talk about uh, what she's found, some of the research she's been doing, and, you know, just, just try and uh, just get a different perspective on tarantula behavior. So please welcome to the podcast, Becky. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> with my tarantulas uh, welcoming you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. So if you could just maybe uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, and what it is that you do, and we'll, we'll jump in. Yeah. So my name is Becky Hansis O'Neill, and I am a PhD student at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, and I study animal behavior. I have a long history of working with invertebrates. I did that for my master's work at Idaho State University. Uh, and now I'm working primarily with bumblebees and tarantulas. So what I did is, and every PhD student has to do this, is you go through all the scientific literature, all the studies that have been done that's related to what you want to research, and you essentially have to summarize them. So it helps you remember and all of that. And I started to think, you know, this might actually be useful to keep or, for keepers to write some of this down. So I just wrote some up, some summaries on my personal blog, shared it out to the Tarantula Collective. Um, yeah, and I got some really nice uh, feedback. I think a lot of people read it. Uh, and it gives us a little more of the scientific perspective about tarantula cognition. So essentially how they process information about their environment and make decisions about how to behave. Yeah, that, I think is the, the cognition part is what really kind of caught, caught my attention. Uh, something I was fascinated with because it seems for, a, I mean, as long as I've had tarantulas, so since like 2000, this is kind of when I got into the hobby, the prevailing theory, I guess, was that they are purely instinctual based. Um, they they don't recognize you. They don't have memory. They there's you know they're they're just a dumb arachnid. You know, it's just they see food, they jump on it, they eat it, they run from you know they just fight or flight or eat like that. That that's it. They're pretty simple. And anytime someone you know made any kind of post talking about, I think my my tarantulas become habituated to, uh, you know, feeding or they recognize me or, you know, any, anything. It's a, like almost the first comment on any post like that is somebody saying, uh, I know you're an idiot. You're amphimorphified, amphimorphified, amphimorph you know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> that hard <Yep>. word. <laughs> you're, you're giving like human characteristics to an animal uh, and, and just kind of shut it down. And like, I, I, I noticed some things just in my time keeping that it felt like they were remembering something or, you know, they, they have a, a better understanding of the environment and what's happening than what we give them credit for. But, you know, any, but like I said, anytime you mention something like that, people get really up in arms about it. And uh, so when you made that post and were able to like actually cite re like uh, sources of research, I, I found that really fascinating. And uh, just for anybody that hasn't read your post, uh, I mean, would you mind just kind of explaining uh, with some of the, the research that you came across? 
Yeah, so I think the big one to tackle is probably memory, because without memory, it's, you know, you can't really learn anything. So, oh, let me think about how to start this history. So this was a study that came out, I think it was in the early 2000s. You'll have to look at my my post. Okay. But this scientist went down to Texas, gathered up some Afona Palma adults from the wild, brought them back to the lab. And this researcher has long since passed away. This was at the end of his career. And uh, he taught them to avoid a shock. So he suspended them over a, a little bit of water. And if they dropped their legs, one of their legs would hit the water. That would close the circuit. and It would zap them a little bit. So they learned to keep their foot up. What was really interesting about this is, I think it was it would have been decades earlier, there's a specific drug that researchers figured out inhibited learning if you gave it to people, animals, whatever. And it, what it does is it stops protein synthesis in the brain. And that's a process that you need for neuronal flexibility. So I'm trying to not get too jargony, but basically you need to be able to synthesize proteins to learn. <laughs> so... He gave the tarantulas this drug, and lo and behold, they couldn't learn to keep their foot up. Um, so that was one study. The other, this is much, much older, totally different researcher. Wasn't He used air puffs. He didn't shock any tarantulas. So he and his students put them in what we call a Y maze. So it's a little maze, looks just like a Y. Animal can go left or right. And he taught them to avoid the air puff over about a month using different sensory cues. So either direction, left or right, the one that was lit would always be safe, or the one that was lit with a kind of light called polarized light would always be safe, or only the left side was always safe. And they were able to learn that. It, and he did, I think, a session a day over a month. So they're not they're not like your dog, where you teach them to sit in a day or, or something like that. It takes a long time. But they were able to learn that um, and remember it. And what I thought was cool is since this happened over a month, they definitely had to remember what they were learning. And then when they switched the task, say, okay, now the right arm is the safe arm instead of the left arm, or the one without light is now the safe one. They learned that pretty quick. So they could learn to pick up on that. So those are my two big learning studies that I posted about. Is there like a difference between a tarantula becoming habituated to something and actually like learning or remembering, uh, or, or is that essentially the same thing? Yeah, so there are different types of learning. So learning to go left or right and make that kind of decision, we call that operant conditioning or respondent learning. And that you see generally in vertebrates and invert, invertebrates that have a little bit more going on. You're not going to see that in like a flatworm or a sea slug. Uh, so habituation, on the other hand, there's two different meanings. You can have the strict nervous system definition where the more you get prodded, your fight or flight response just stops because nothing bad ever happens after you get prodded. So that's that's one kind of habituation. And that's probably the big one. I think I'll actually stick with that one. So yeah, they are different. Habituation we tend to see in most, pretty much all animals, operant conditioning, not so much. You're not going to see a sea anemone doing that, for example. So if you're able to to establish that tarantulas are able to kind of have that operate, what would you call that? Operational conditioning? Yeah, operant conditioning. Or if you call it respondent conditioning, that's fine too. Gotcha. So what are, what are the, uh, I don't want to say consequences, that's probably not the right word, but uh, if if that is the case, um, moving forward, like, how does that expand our understanding and our knowledge of tarantulas? Yeah, I'd say in terms of husbandry, it means that, especially for things like uh, tong feeding. I know I, I have a very small collection of tarantulas. It's like five. But I definitely have some that have learned the tongs mean food. And they come right out and they're like, yes, cricket, please, versus others that don't. So knowing that, hey, they can learn that kind of thing. And also habituation that they might know your particular steps. That's a different vibration pattern that's coming through the floor up into their tanks versus like your dog or the cat or kids that tend to have very fast, more jerky movements, I would say. So they can learn things about their environment, which means that your husbandry practices do matter for how they behave. So are, are you suggesting then that tarantulas can remember their keepers? Uh, not exactly. No. And in the blog post, I get a little more specific about this. We don't really know what the world looks like or feels like to a tarantula. 
I have no idea what they think people are. <laughs> so when a keeper comes up and you have this big looming face, what exactly can they see? What information can they get out of that? Unsure. But if they habituate, what they can probably learn is that this set of sensory inputs, so it could be your steps, your smell, whatever, never precedes anything scary. So for people that say, I swear my tarantula is more calm for me than my spouse or my kids or something like that. Yeah. I think they can totally habituate and essentially learn that all those inputs that you give them don't equate to anything scary. There's no bad consequence. So they essentially can get used to you. I don't think they're going to recognize people like your dog or cat can. I'm just not sure their nervous systems are set up to do that. But people aren't aren't crazy when they say my tarantula behaves this that way with me and maybe not someone else. So it's not like they can see you and identify your face and know this is the person that feeds me and takes care of me. So they're not a threat. It's more of, they just kind of get used to the vibrations that you produce. And, and it's not so much that they know who you are. They just know that, that you're not a danger. Is that, am I following you? Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. And it's probably more than vibration. It's probably smell. It's pr probably lots of different things, but yeah, it's more like, okay, all this stuff that's happening in my world, this nothing bad have ever happens after this, or hey, I get food when this happens. So yeah, yeah we're talking about that. But one thing I found interesting is that it wasn't just that one study that, that you've mentioned. There were there were other studies that kind of test kind of came in from different angles. So uh, would you mind talking a little bit about that? Sure. So there's um one that I think, well, actually two that I think would also be super helpful for keepers that has less to do with their learning and more can they get stressed out or not. Um, and I've seen people on the Tarantula Collective uh, Facebook page mention at least one of these before, and people actually are pretty good about interpreting this. So there was one where uh, scientists took just a few tarantulas and just a few scorpions. We're talking like less than 10. They put them in little uh, enclosures and put UVB right over top of them. We're talking within a foot of the top of the enclosure, and they were short enclosures. And they measured cortisol over time which most people have heard of that in zoo animals because it often correlates to stress. It's, it can get a little more complicated than that, but in vertebrate animals, animals with the backbone generally correlates to stress. And they saw increases in cortisol after sampling hemolymph, so blood. So to me, that one was particularly interesting. And it was, there were so few tarantulas in that study that essentially we, have, we, need, we really need scientists to do it again. But the cool thing about it was demonstrating that, hey, you can measure cortisol in these animals in the same way we do vertebrates, and it looks like we can get a response. So that, that's one. I don't know if, you, if we want to spend a little time on that one before the second one. Um, I mean, did you have more to add? Like, I, I guess what I'm kind of confused about, I think, I mean, not confused, but uh, what I wonder about is, one, why did they even decide to do that kind of experiment? And two, like, why they didn't follow through with, with more research? Yeah, so there's a couple reasons for that. So the big reason why would you do that to begin with is we don't actually have really great empirical, so what I mean by empirical is really good scientific measures, essentially how the tarantula might be feeling if they're stressed out or not. So seeing if we can do it the same way with as vertebrates, with cortisol, that's that's good. That's one more tool in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. The reason they probably didn't do more is because measuring that is really expensive. I did a little digging into it to see if I wanted to do it, and it looked to me like it was probably going to be a few hundred bucks just to get started, let alone to measure enough spiders to make any big claims. So it's a really expensive way to measure stress. And so, so essentially what that has taught us then is that when people say, you know, you're, you're the way that you have them set up is stressing them out, like the, you know, they're, the setup of their enclosure is causing them stress or handling them is causing them stress. There's an actual physiological, there's, there's phys physiological evidence to support that. Yeah, we'd have to measure those particular cases, like is handling associated with higher cortisol levels or are crummy enclosures that don't have good places to hide or those correlated. We'd, we'd have to repeat the studies to test those specifically. But yeah, we know that we can get this response. Because I don't know about you, but I would expect any arachnid, if I blasted them with full UVB, UVA right above them, that that would, yeah. not, that that would freak them out. That wouldn't be very right. good. 
they probably feel very exposed and blinded and yeah. Yep. They had a little note in that study about uh, an OBT and anything they tried to do with that spider after the UVB was just really hard because that animal was so defensive and running around and freaking out. I know they have a reputation to begin with, but they specifically noted this spider kind of lost its marbles. And did they have any idea how long they remain stressed out or how long the cortisol stayed in their system? I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know a lot about the biology, so that may be a dumb question. No, that's not a dumb question. And that was one of the critiques I had of that study is they kind of stopped and didn't do it anymore. And I would kind of think that, well, you kind of want to show that they calm down when you put them in a, a nice, good enclosure. And then you want to show that if you put the light back, it goes back up, the cortisol levels. So they didn't really show that relationship over time. And my guess, this is just my conjecture, is that was with cost. So I hope somebody finishes that that research up. And what was the other study you were referring to? Yeah, so this one's a little bit older. And, oh, I'm going to forget the species they used. But these folks uh, took juvenile arboreals. I want to say it was um, some kind of pink toe. Anyway, they raised half of them in crummy enclosures, no place to hide, that kind of thing. And then the other half in enriched enclosures that had lots of places to hide and just much more appropriate for natural settings. So, And they kept them there for a long time. I want to say it was like a year or two. And then they took them out and they put them in what we call an arena. So it's, it's essentially a little box where we can film their behavior without obstructions. Mm -hmm. And they found that the tarantulas that were in the unenriched enclosures, so the crummy enclosures, were much more likely to fret, fret pose. When they ran away from a stimulus, they ran farther. They were just more flighty and had a lot of um, what we would call stress behaviors, like if we were behaving that way. Yeah. The tarantulas that were in enriched enclosures, they uh, didn't do as much of that. They were less likely to throw threat poses if they ran away from like a little brush poke. They didn't run as far. Yeah. They also did that classic, um, if anyone keeps juvenile arboreals, that classic tube web that you'll see often in the corner of the enclosures. And the unenriched spiders didn't do that. That's very good. That kind of mirrors my experience and some things. I've, I know when I first was keeping tarantulas, it was very much, um, I, I, I don't want to say it was the standard, but like the accepted kind of husbandry was, you know, just an aquarium or like a sterile light box with substrate and a piece of cork or something like that for a hide and a water dish. That was about it. And the, it, it seemed that, you know, it was, uh, like I had a couple of, I had a, a rose hair. And she was always very defensive. Anytime I threw some crickets in there, it was immediate threat pose. And, you know, probably about hey, seven or eight years ago, I started getting more. It was, it was really, it was like right after I got married and started kind of growing my <laughs> enclosure in the house that I had with my wife. She was okay with me kind of growing the amount of spiders that I was keeping. But one of her stipulations was they have to look nice, you know? So that was kind of, I couldn't just have stacks of Tupperware, you know, yeah. or, or Sterilite. She wanted it to, if we had friends or family come over and they saw it, that it was something visually, it just didn't look messy or, mm -hmm. you know, like, like I was hoarding spiders or something. <laughs> so I started spending a lot more time, you know, just really, and, and I also found it ex extremely enjoyable. It's like little Zen gardens. It was, it became as, I love that part of the hobby as much as actually interacting and keeping the tarantulas, like just kind of trying to build the most naturalistic enclosure I could. And I started noticing, like I would see some, People on like some guys on YouTube who were keeping theirs in sterilite enclosures talking about how defensive their OBT was or how defensive, you know, specific species were. But then you would see like it's in a sterilite tub or it's in a critter keeper and it's just got cocoa fiber and a hide and a water dish. And those same species that I had moved to more naturalistic enclosures, I wasn't having that problem with. Like they had the ability to retreat and hide somewhere safe. Anytime I was like interacting with their enclosure, feeding them, changing the water, cleaning it, whatever. They were able to kind of, you know, find somewhere safe. And I did, wasn't getting threat poses. Like they weren't running around the enclosure like crazy. Um, like with the Postletheria metallica, that was, that was a big one. I had a lot of people saying like, this is an extremely defensive tarantula. I think um, that's a study I'd love to see with critters that are tarantulas that actually have these reputations for being a little gnarly, like your OBTs and your poise. Oh, I'm going to say it wrong. Poise, Celia, Theriums. Um, the ornamentals. There we go. I'll call them that. <laughs> That's easier to say. 
Yeah, where if they have really proper enclosures, are they coming out and doing that defensive stuff when you fill their water or drop a cricket in and that kind of thing? I'd love to see if there's a correlation between enclosure niceness and and how nice the spider is. Yeah, I mean, at first I didn't put it, to, I didn't put two and two together. I just was like, I must just got lucky, and a lot of these species I have are just a lot more uh, docile than these other people. But uh, then other people started saying kind of the same thing. It just seemed like the more naturalistic the enclosure, the more, what was the word that you used? Enriched, maybe? Rich, that's it. <laughs> the more <laughs> enrichment was available, the less stressed they seemed to be. And, and it even got to the point, this is a few years ago, uh, you may remember this, but there was like a fad for a while to put ping pong balls in the tra- <laughs> enclosures. Yeah. And, spin around and move them and play with them and and people were getting like really, there was some people saying like, look, my spider's playing with this ball. And other people were like, no, that's just instinctual behavior. It's in its way. It doesn't like it. It's not natural. And it's, it's like, <laughs> I don't want this here. And they're trying to get rid of it. But when you would watch some of the videos, it, it kind of looked like it was entertaining itself. You know, it wasn't like it was just pushing it to the corner. It would move it around and. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. And I don't have like the ping pong ball answers. I have totally put ping pong balls in the enclosures just to kind of see what they do. Um, And that's something I'm starting to try to get what I call pilot data. So it means I'm basically just messing around and writing it down before doing really big, really highly structured experiments. So I've been putting novel objects in with a few tarantulas in the lab. So novel just meaning they've never seen that object before and then filming them 24 seven over the weekend and then coming back and seeing what they do. Yeah. And so far I haven't given them things, the lab tarantulas, uh, a ping pong ball that they could move around, but I've noticed one thing in common. They kind of come out and they take their pedipalps or maybe that first leg and they touch the object And then they might hang out there and then it depends on the tarantula. Maybe it's 20 minutes, maybe it's a few hours. And then after that, they're kind of like, okay. And then they start going back and doing their normal thing. So they do seem to explore new things. And when I've seen them manipulating ping pong balls, I really think that's kind of what's going on. They're like, what's this new thing? Because they roll it around. I've seen some manipulate it with their fangs, but they're not biting into it. It doesn't look predatory. So... Yeah, I think they explore new stuff. And so far, my guess, my hypothesis is just anything new in their enclosure, they're eventually going to come kind of explore it. So uh, I, I got to be honest, like I, I read the post, I reached out to you, see if you want to discuss this, you know, on the podcast, but I didn't follow the post uh, as in like, I didn't continually check back and look at the comments. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you get a lot of pushback, like negative pushback for making that post or did for the most part were people kind of agreeing with you or, you know, excited with the information? Yeah, so I was super surprised because I was expecting people to come out and go, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't care that you're in a PhD program. Eh, You just don't know. Um, But that's actually not what happened. Nobody said that. Um, I had a lot of people thanking me for the post because they hadn't got access to that information in one place and just saying cool food for thought and a lot of really positive reactions, actually. So, And I tried to be really well balanced. Like I'm not going to come in and say, yes, your tarantula recognizes you and they love being handled and you have a bond. Didn't say anything extreme yeah. in that sense. So I think that may have put the naysayers away. <laughs> <laughs> did you just post it in the tarantula collective Facebook group or did you cross post it? I, groups I have not cross posted it yet. So oh, I could. Because <laughs> yeah. I feel like uh, by and large, I think a lot of like the hard headed trolls have been removed from the group. <laughs> so it's like, you know, that, that, because I, it's, it's, you know, it's just kind of, I guess it's with all hobbies, but, you know, you kind of get people, they're just setting their ways and, you know, they've gone on record saying this is how things are. And it, it, it's hard to go back and be like, hey, I may have been wrong, you know, even if like yep. the research at the time was on your side, you know, things change and sometimes it's hard to kind of go along with, with uh, to adapt, I guess, you know, and. Yeah, the big the big thing that I have gone on on Facebook and tried to be very polite about, but I definitely try to call it out when I see it, is this idea that invertebrates or our spiders don't have brains. That's like a big myth that I see trolls kind of coming out with <laughs> and they'll, that people yeah. try to push. And we know that's not true. And I have had a couple people say, oh, thank you for, this makes more sense. Thank you for explaining this. But most people are just kind of like, eh, and they blow me off. Yeah, I did a video on tarantula anatomy and and was even like talking about like, this is kind of like their central nervous system. It's kind of like their brain and got a lot of pushback in the comments. Like, no, you're an idiot. That isn't a brain. You know, that's, that's essentially just like where all of their nerve endings come together. And, you know, it's, they're still, they, they can't think they're purely instinctual. And I'm like, I didn't 
make this up. Like I read a <laughs> scientific paper that had all this broken down and then I got this like model and it was in there as well. So it's like, I, I feel like they know a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> so I, yeah. And if you went to an animal behavior conference or an arachnology conference, the scientists aren't going to, I would be very real surprised if anyone bothered you about calling it a brain. Yeah. You know, it's a central collection of nerves that processes sensory information in their head. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially with some of the studies coming out recently with uh, jumping spiders and, and the fact they can track eye movements while they're sleeping, essentially. And they're like, are, are they dreaming? Like, what's going on inside their brain? Like, it, it, I just find that stuff really fascinating because there's two parts really to it. Like, one, I just think it's it would be really cool, you know, if, if our tarantulas were smarter or more aware than we initially thought they were. And I think that's what, like, like I was saying earlier, I think some people, uh, you know, just kind of, I don't want to call them like old heads, but people that have been in the hobby for 30 or 40 years or have been keeping tarantulas for a while or just kind of were mentored by someone like that, they really kind of get set in their way like these are just dumb instinctual invertebrates and they're just going to have a fight or, fight or fight response. They're going to react to uh, any kind of stimuli they may interpret as food. Beyond that, there is n there's there's nothing any deeper than that. Like it's a very shallow existence, and right. I think a lot of people that have been keeping, especially for many years, it, they struggle with that. You know, it, because it's it's kind of like well, I, I have seen some habituation, I have seen some behavior that is not explained by that, and so you know, I think a lot of these people. Uh, I'm not going to call anyone out by name, but I've butted heads with some of them before in the past. And it's like, they kind of say, well, well, this one arachnologist told me this, or this one biologist told me this in like 1995, or it's in the tarantula keeper's handbook, or you know, whatever they have like right. that one thing that kind of backs them up. And it's like, yeah, but that was 25, 30 years ago. Like science has progressed since there's been more research. There's been studies. There's been stuff that was already researched. We just weren't aware of it because it was, you know, and on a bookshelf in some college library or something like, you know, totally. it, yeah, I mean, the, the, the internet's exploded since then. A lot more information's online. And it's a lot easier to, to access. So I think part of it's just pride. Like they've like, I've already made this video or this podcast or this blog post or stated this in some forum somewhere. So I got to stand behind my initial vibe, you know, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a chunk of it. But I also kind of think that there's also the ramifications if you do accept this as a fact, that a lot of people aren't comfortable with having to deal with moving forward. Uh, for for instance, since, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago, it's kind of since I started noticing that my tarantulas were a lot more docile and, and essentially they were a lot more easier. It was easier for me to film them if I kept them in a more naturalistic enclosure. Like when I took them, I mean, I didn't know about this study you were referring to. It just, that was just something I noticed. Like the ones that I have in basic enclosures give me a lot of threat poses and are, and are bolty and difficult to, to film. But the ones that I have in these naturalistic style enclosures with a lot of plants and hides and, and they a lot of places to web up, when I bring them out, they're a lot more chill and more docile and they walk around a little bit slower and it just is a, no threat poses. You know, it's just a, a much easier experience. So just based on that, I have started switching over. I mean, all of them now are more natural, are all naturalistic enclosures. Uh, even if it's just adding a couple of plants or like fake plants or something like that in there, I try to do something just more than just a water dish and a cork bark hide, you know, and then I've been seeing some success with that. And since I moved in this uh, new studio and I have more room, I'm systematically kind of going through and switching everything, not just from naturalistic, but also kind of to like a bioactive type of enclosure. So with getting out some of like the fake plastic plants and some of the, like just the, the random stuff, and not because I think, I just, I just want to give them the most in kind of naturalistic environment as I can, as well as uh, as much enrichment as possible. Because I think it's the cool thing about real plants over fake plants. Like, it, yeah, they require light and, you know, you got to take care of them and stuff like that. But it's, they grow, they change, they move. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. So it's not like just this one thing that's going to get dirty and fade in the corner. This right. is, is going to be growing with the tarantula and, 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 con and you know, it's not fast, but, you know, it, it does change, you know, year from year, the way it's all kind of set up. And so, I mean, I've, I've been, you know, just slowly kind of getting stuff from the bio dude and stuff like that to kind of get these mm -hmm. things set up. And uh, yeah, it, I don't really worry about it so much for the spiderlings or the juveniles, but once they're an adult, like I want them to have the most naturalistic kind of environment that I can provide. And I've been getting a lot of pushback, like you're just wasting your money or, I mean, it goes from you're wasting your money and doing something that doesn't really matter to this is detrimental to the tarantula, you know? And I think that a lot of the people that are pushing back on the ideas that you kind of presented with this, you know, citing your sources with research and stuff, 
is because they are keeping their tarantulas in sterilized containers, sometimes without even a hide. Like it'll just be the tarantula, some substrate, kind of like a lot of breeders do that, you know, but, yeah. but I think there's a big difference between breeders and keepers. You know, the breeders are, or taxologists, taxonomists, or they, is that what they're called? Taxonomists? People that are just really into like the scientific uh, difference in species and stuff. But yeah. Like, I, I think that's, it, it's one thing for them to keep them in the, that kind of minimalist enclosure. But I think for people that are keeping them as pets, you know, you want to give them the best possible life that you can in, in the best possible environment. And I think that if some of these keepers, like, you know, they're keeping tarantulas as pets in sterilized, minimalistic tubs, if they accept the fact that these things are a little bit more intelligent than we think they are, then their entire husbandry needs to change. You know, like, like it's, it'll be hard. It'll just be some cognitive dissonance. Like, you know, this thing needs enrichment and, and it will thrive in a more not a developed kind of uh, environment. So how am I going to live with myself just keeping it, you know, in the, and so I, I think that that's right. part of the pushback, but that could just be my theory. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> No, I could see that, especially if you have a really big collection. It could be kind of hard to say, oh, I need to overhaul this whole thing. Or yeah, especially if you go back and say, well, my weights are fine. If you weigh them, I, I know a lot. I have one spider. I definitely don't weigh her all the time because that's <laughs> a risk to her. But if they're not dying, if you're able to breed them, like uh, on those welfare measures, maybe they're doing really well. But it's these really fussy things like stress that can be harder to measure or really expensive to measure, like we talked about, that make it, yeah, just harder, I think, to show people the hard evidence. Like, if you move your whole collection in this direction, XYZ will be better. You mentioned weighing. Like, I've weighed my geckos and I've weighed snakes. I've never found a need to weigh my tarantula. <laughs> like, wh why, why, are, why do you weigh tarantulas? So there's a couple reasons. Um, if I have a young one, sometimes I'm looking at growth, and I don't do this all the time. So for all the keepers out there. I'm not like weighing my tarantulas every week or anything like that. But, um, and I also like data as a scientist. It's interesting to me to see weight gains over time, like after molts and that kind of thing. I haven't done it in a while, but yeah. So for me, it's just being a nerd. Okay. <laughs> I was like, maybe I'm missing something here. <laughs> so were there any other stories or uh, studies, not stories <laughs> that you mentioned that, uh, you know, you want to talk about? Yeah. There's one more that I think would be really good to discuss, especially since you were talking about stress. So we look at invertebrates versus people and really interesting in tarantulas that they also, you can measure cortisol, how useful that is, we don't know. But some of their neurotransmitters, specifically in, I would say, insects, arachnids, any of the arthropods, some of them are very similar to, to people. And a couple of those are dopamine and serotonin. So the last study I want to, well, maybe not the last, but one that I think is worth discussing, mm -hmm. the scientists paired up male tarantulas that they had collected uh, from the wild. And anytime they fought, they would take those tarantulas back, euthanize them, and look at the amount of serotonin in their brains. Oh, geez. Yeah. So if the tarantulas fought at all, they had lower serotonin levels, and it was worse than the losers. And they also looked at dopamine and um, another neurotransmitter called octopamine that humans don't have, but serotonin was the big one. So I'm not claiming that these tarantulas are getting depression or anything like that, but yeah. we see similar changes in them that we see in other animals like us. And then what you want to think about them euthanizing all these tarantulas just to look at the neurotransmitters, that's like a whole different philosophical discussion. But yeah. uh, that's what they did and that's what they found. Why did they even test that to begin with, I guess? Is it just, just curiosity? Yeah. So what I've noticed is looking just in animal behavior literatures, you get a lot of studies where people want to compare some new species where the study has never been done with other animals. So in this case saying, hey, do tarantulas maybe arachnids more generally, do they have similar responses to other animals with regard to serotonin? So it's basically understanding how that neurotransmitter works across all kinds of different animals and better understanding how it evolved. Like all this learning stuff, did that evolve very early in animals? Do we all have some of the same stuff as long as you're an animal? Or did it show up independently? Like serotonin being correlated with depressive states or... Uh, mediating social interactions? Is that just in mammals or vertebrates or is that just in arachnids? Did it pop up separate times? My guess is probably not. I think dopamine and serotonin functions in the brain are probably pretty old. Yeah, I've had a few other you know doctoral candidates or students on mm -hmm. as well as a few professors. And the reoccurring theme is there's just a severe lack of 
research on tarantulas. And I'm, I'm always curious as, as why do you think that is? Like, why are, why, why are they so, why aren't they studied as much as other animals or even why aren't studied as much as other arachnids? I think it's much, say I wanted to study this in wolf spiders. I could go get all the wolf spiders I needed in a weekend and bring them in the lab. Or if I went out into the field, very easy to find. Same with jumpers, especially now that jumpers are going through more captive breeding programs as popularity is with pets. I imagine we'll see them more often as well. So I think adult tarantulas are probably a bit less available unless you want to wild collect. And that's a whole other thing. I think secondly, in terms of behavior, they're a really cool system, but you have to be really, really patient. Yeah. So the studies I cited um, where they learned to go left or right in a maze, they trained them for a month. And jumping spiders, you can train much, much faster. So you have to have a lot of patience to work with them. I don't think they're quite as easy to get. And you have to be really careful with wild populations. Are you hurting the population? That kind of thing. Um, And I think some of it is also interest. I think a few of us kind of narrow in on it, on tarantulas and say, yes, that's the thing. But I think a lot of folks don't. And I, and I couldn't tell you why, why some people think they're interesting and some people think they're not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, you mentioned when you were kind of introducing yourself, um, this is kind of a tangent, so bear with me. But you mentioned that you also were studying bees. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, when I had Dr. Linda Rayer on from Cornell, she also had a similar kind of story. Like she, she, she was studying bees and then kind of got into arachnids and was like kind of doing both for a while. If I'm remembering correctly, I feel like that's what she said. Like, is there some kind of like crossover physiologically? Like, or, I mean, why, why both of those things? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not really comparing them directly, but they're very good for very different things. So if you want to do learning studies, bees are awesome because when, and I study bumblebees, but they for they the worker bees, they go out and they forage and they will just do learning experiments with you all day for little tiny sugar rewards and you can teach them all kinds of stuff. Tarantulas yeah. are maybe happy to eat once a week and if they're not feeling it, maybe once a month or once every three months. So your opportunities to reward them for behavior are very, very small. Um, so that's why you see a lot of punishment, people shocking them or hitting them with air puffs, I think, because that's the path of least resistance for teaching them things. So the bumblebees and honeybees too are just really great for certain kinds of studies that a big, large bodied arachnid that doesn't eat very often might not be as good. So it's good to have multiple species in your, your scientific tool belt. Now this may be, um, I feel like most of my questions are dumb questions, but uh, is there any way or has there been in, in the past, or like, especially when you were kind of going through all this research that was done previously, I mean, has anyone ever like, you know, put a tarantula in, I don't even know what the right, like an MRI or a CAT scan type of thing and like got images of them internally while they're still alive or, you know, yeah. how they do with monkeys and they, they'll kind of put those, um, those things on their head to kind of like track brain activity and stuff like that. I mean, is it possible to do something like that with a tarantula or is the only way to kind of see what's going on to euthanize them and, and do an autopsy or whatever? Yeah, so I I think this is getting a little bit out of my expertise, so bear with me, folks. I'm offering a little bit of just conjecture on my part. So there's images of their uh, internal anatomy, um, I believe CAT scans, and MRI, I think, too, actually, now that I think about it, while they're dead, just so we can learn about their anatomy. And the research about their anatomy, at least from my animal behavior perspective, it looks pretty good. There's a lot of good stuff. What I see more with spiders, including tarantulas, is actually putting electrodes in the nervous system and measuring activity that way, as opposed to an MRI with blood flow. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure if you could do that with a tarantula while they were still alive. I know you could anesthetize them just like you could any other animal, but in terms of how the resolution on the MRI and looking at something that small, how good it is, that I'm not sure, but not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was just uh, something I've always kind of been curious about. Like, I, I never really know if it's a lack of technology or just a lack of interest. You know, <laughs> some of the stuff that hasn't, you know, kind of been done with tarantulas. I would say with that, probably interest. And I know people have done it with anatomy. So if they watch this this podcast, they're going to be like, oh, we have done that. Why are you saying this? <laughs> um, but I would say really pushing that forward and trying to look at uh, nervous system activity over time 
that's probably an interest in a funding thing because that's going to take somebody a while to develop that and make sure that it's working right. Um, so I'd say it's, it's probably interest. I bet you could make something like that work, mm-hmm. but you'd need some time and some money. It always comes down to money with these things. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you, you did this research, you know, you can kind of compiled all these different studies uh, into one place, which was something personally I hadn't seen before, but I may just have been unaware of it. Like, how did you, because I've been, I've been making content for, you know, three or four years now, and I'm constantly searching, trying to find scientific information uh, and stuff like that. And I never came across some of these studies that you shared. How did you find them and how could other people find that kind of information in the future? Yeah, so newer stuff is easier to find, but some of these things were really old. Like we're talking the 70s. I think I have one or two papers from the 60s. And what I get as a student is my university subscribes to different journal content and different databases. So these things aren't stuck behind paywalls in a lot of cases for me. So that makes it easier to get. Yeah, that's kind of the big thing is actually having access to the journals. But then the second thing is some of these things I found when I was trying to find information on bumblebees or some other invertebrate, and I couldn't even find it until I was looking for something else. And it just happened to to come up because I was looking at something about invertebrate learning or this Mm -hmm. or that. So I wouldn't be surprised if I find more as I go along. Um, But I'd say the age is a big thing and then things getting stuck behind paywalls. I had heard something recently. I don't so I probably have to fact check me on this because it's like I heard it in another podcast <laughs> and like I just like oh that sounds true and <laughs> never really looked into it much but they were it was kind of talking about the the scam really or the like you know just this this evil thing that is the paywall behind research papers in universities and it was actually just Jelaine Maxwell like that woman that was with Jeffrey Epstein oh, <laughs> guy, okay it was her father. That kind of created that whole system with universities. Huh. You put you put these studies in these like these books or the subscription service, and universities will have to pay you to have access to the most up to date stuff instead of it just being freely available to everyone. And I don't I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, that's a that's a pretty dark conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea who invented it. I have no idea. Um, I don't know the same, but yeah, but it it does it does prevent dissemination to the public. And what I have found. Now that I've come back to graduate school, because I was working in industry for about eight years, now I'm back in academia, is that professors often have to put a little money aside, whether it's in a grant or the university is helping them to pay extra to make something open access for everyone. So there's like even more of a squeeze on on people that are publishing research um, to make it freely available. Yeah, I actually had a, a couple of people reach out to me and like, and, and pretty much say like, "Hey, I have because I'm I'm a student or whatever. I have access to this like library of research information yep. that isn't available. I'd be happy to give you my login credentials if you want, or you know, tell me what you're looking for. I'll find it and send it to you." And I'm always like, "Yes." And then <laughs> like a couple couple weeks later, a month later, I'm like, "I need to take advantage of that." And then I can never find the message. It gets buried under other emails and stuff. So. I mean, is it possible for, I mean, do you have to be a student at a university to get access to that information or can like anybody subscribe and, and get access? So there's a couple things that can, anybody can subscribe to these publishers, but it's often prohibitively expensive. It's like, it's not worth it, but there's a couple things you can do. So if you hop onto Google Scholar, so if you just punch Google Scholar into Google, it'll switch you to the Scholar page and you start looking for information you want it can often scrape the internet and find you some free versions of things to get. You can also, if you find a study and all you can see is just the abstract summary, but it lists all the authors, often you can directly email one of the authors. Usually their emails are right there and say, hey, I'd really like a copy of this and they can give it to you. And I look at that on Twitter. Like some uh, someone would post a link to some paper yeah. that had published, but I couldn't see it. And I would just leave a comment or send them a message. And they'd be like, oh, here you go. And they would just send me like a PDF that I could see it. I was like, oh, nice. Well, and I don't know how familiar you might be with like torrenting and and that kind of thing to get free. (laughs) It's illegal, (laughs) but to get pirated content. So there there are services like that for academic papers. Um, Given my status as a student, I'm not like going to give all the instructions for that on this podcast, but there are some other ways. (laughs) Yeah, I I will refer. I don't want to get you in trouble. I I think (laughs) there was another podcast a couple of years ago with someone uh, at a university and they mentioned it. And then was like, 
hey, I need you to edit that out. <laughs> so, yeah, and it, it, it's out there. You can find it. Um, but yeah, it, it does. It is a little illegal, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> so was Napster and that didn't stop me. I, just, <laughs> I don't know. So, so what is it that you're hoping to uh, learn or uh, wh- why are you doing this research? Yeah, so I'm really interested in a couple things. So I'm really interested in evolution and how... Um, nervous systems evolve. So that's one. But the other is I'm interested in animal welfare research. And it's not because I'm like a vegan card carrying PETA member or anything like that. It's because it's interesting to me that I can look at something like a spider or a fish that looks very different from a person and have less empathy. And I've always thought, well, why is that? Yeah. Because the evidence isn't just like we shouldn't anthropomorphize animals, we shouldn't do the opposite either and assume that they have no capacity for suffering or no feeling. So I've been really interested in just personally how we measure that kind of thing. So if things have the capacity to be content or happy versus stressed out, sad, that kind of thing. And how do you even define those things? Because those aren't even easy to define with people. So I'm really interested in how we do that. And specifically, I'm interested in invertebrates because they're so understudied. Now, I may be putting the cart before the horse here, but uh, do you have like a game plan moving forward? Like how you're going to, or, can, is that something you can talk about or would that jeopardize grants or? Just- no, 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 it won't or anything like that. But, um, and it's good to know, especially if there's like young people that are considering a science career to know how this works for PhD student. So you get accepted to a PhD program and you form what's called your graduate committee. And it's a bunch of, it's usually a few professors and they review everything you do, everything you write, every all the experiments you want to do. Um, And then when you write it all up at the end, they kind of put the stamp on it and say, yes or no, you pass, you don't pass. So Mm -hmm. I'm in the process of writing up the experiments I want to do and giving them to my committee. So tarantula is one of the big ones I want to do is I actually want to study fight or flight because we know a little bit about that physiologically in tarantulas, but not so much the behavioral component. Um, So I want to use a heart rate monitor on them a non in, non-invasive one, because sometimes people just put an a electrode right into the cardiac muscle and that I don't want to do that. So I want to know what happens to their heart rate when they're exposed to different stimuli, like when they've just caught something and they're eating it versus a little air puff versus bright light, those kind of things versus just hanging out in your burrow, having a good time. So I want to see what their heart rate does. And if that those changes look similar to what we see in vertebrates. Um, And then I also want to use, I talked about operant conditioning before. I want to use something called classical conditioning. Most people have heard of that with Pavlov's dogs Mm -hmm. and see if we can actually train them to associate different stimuli with something else. For example, um, a flashlight flicker means you're about to get hit with an air puff. Do they start over time? This minute you show them the light, does that heart rate go up? Are they showing evidence that they're learning that association? And this is sort of a case of science telling us what people probably, we already know of. They're going to be able to learn that, or at least I'm pretty confident they will. Most animals that are able to move around are going to be able to be conditioned in that way. So that's what I want to do is I want to look at their cardiovascular response for fight or flight or just excitement in general and see if we can classically condition that response. And is that similar to what we see in other animals or ourselves? So that's one. And then I have a little side project with tarantulas. It's all conservation based. And that probably won't end up in my dissertation or in my thesis or dissertation, whatever you want to call it. Okay. I like conservation though. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking? Yeah. So that I've already started. So this has been super interesting. It's, it's, um, it's here in Missouri and I'm not going to tell you anything that's not or like already on the the state's website about tarantulas. But in Missouri, they live in glade habitats. And in Missouri, those habitats tend to be a little drier and warmer, full of volcanic rock. So I have been out there counting tarantulas to see how many we've got um, and where they like to put their burrows and how big they are and how many males and females. And if we put little tags on them, does it look, can we find them again later? That kind of thing. And we're also starting to look at some genetics. So I want to know One problem with glade habitats is they become very uh, patchy over time. 
So as people expanded west after colonization, they started fighting forest fires, which are very important to maintaining glades. You got to burn down trees so they don't take over. So now we have little patches of glades everywhere. So I want to know, what does that have to do with tarantulas? Well, if they can't cross these woods, they can't mate with each other. And then they start to potentially become inbred. So I'm trying to figure out if that's happening with our tarantulas here in Missouri. So figuring out where they like to live and if they're getting inbred because their habitat isn't quite as nice as it used to be. I don't have all a, a great knowledge of Missouri. Uh, so the area you're referring to, I mean, I don't have to say specifically where it is, but mm -hmm. how far away from like St. Louis is that? Yeah, so the glades are all over and I won't say exactly where my site is, but we have glades that are all the way at the bottom of the state, plus some that are closer to St. Louis. But maybe maybe I'll try a little mind reading here. Are you interested in if tarantulas living near metropolitan areas maybe get collected more often? Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> that, yes, partially. Um, it, and more because you just mentioned it. It's like, yeah, I do want to know that. Um, but really, it was when I go to St. Louis, which I do a couple times a year, oh. could I come with you? <laughs> oh, yeah, so I would just get permission. So I have a, a permit that's very specific about who I take and where I go, but I can certainly ask, and and usually they're pretty good. I don't want to collect anything. I more just right. kind of follow you around and see what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, come do some science. So I have students yeah. and stuff. Other students come out all the time. So yeah, if you're in the St. Louis area, hit me up. Let me let me check on that, and then we'll just have to chat about like how can you make this into like something that you can share without like giving away where things are, but that is a potentially reasonable thing to do. So, yeah. Because I, I think that there, I don't think I, I have had experienced <laughs> this for many years, but there's, there seems to be this divide between uh, pet keepers and the scientific community, you know, like researchers and stuff like that. And it's almost, it, it just kind of feels like for the most part, they don't like the hobby for, for a myriad of reasons. Some of them are very valid, you know, like, the pet industry can be detrimental to uh, wild uh, individuals. You know, they, there's a lot of wild caught specimens that are, are you know, smuggled out of countries and stuff like that. And, and it can be, uh, you know, disastrous for, you know, some, some colonies in, 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 especially places like Thailand and, and Sri Lanka and places like that. Like we're seeing both like a, a double whammy. There's habitat destruction from urban sprawl, but then there's also over collection uh, and an illegal collection. So it's like, you know, when both of those factors are working together, it's really easy to decimate a population and make them endangered or just extinct. So I, I, I understand yeah. that. Uh, but there's also a lot of captive breeding going on. There's a lot of people that are very passionate about them. They just don't have this scientific background. Like, like me, for example, I, could, I, I did environmental science in college. And that was about as far as my brain could take it. <laughs> Any other science class I took, I would fail or have to drop. <laughs> so it's like my brain is, was you know, the other, just math and stuff like that. I, my brain is like, nope, we're shutting down. Uh, it's, so it's like, I'm interested in it, but I don't have the background or a, a accessibility. So I'm just labeled as a pet keeper and, and not, and I'm speaking in generalization. There, mm -hmm. There's some people I've met that are in the scientific community that have been very helpful and generous and I've got good relationships with, but a lot of them won't even return my phone calls or I just dated myself again. Really, they don't return my messages or emails. So I don't think I've actually called them. I don't, that can be, I have scientists that don't return my messages either. <laughs> so it's okay. I think it's <laughs> just scientists. And yeah. science is hard. Like I'm, um, I'm dyslexic. So a lot of chemistry and math has been really difficult for me. I have to work extra hard just to pass the class. So it's been a slog sometimes, but it's, it's getting better. Geometry, I always got straight okay. in. But when algebra, I for whatever reason, just uh, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I do better now that there's so many computer programs to help me with statistics. Wow. That's um, cool. But yeah, going back to the tarantulas. So when you said something about like captive collecting, especially when we're talking about Southeast Asian populations where you're getting collecting for illegal export as well as habitat degradation, I was really surprised here in Missouri to see how low the populations were at my site. Oh, wow. And I don't think that it's necessary. I think collecting could be part of it, depending how close they are to metropolitan areas. But I also think just because the habitat in Missouri has become so degraded and so small, and we only have a Phonopelma hensi, mm -hmm. so only Texas browns. And if you keep them, you know they take a very long time to mature, even the males. So their reproductive rate, their population growth is never going to be very fast. 
So I think just this combination of factors over time has made this population just much more sensitive than I think anyone would expect for a phonopalma because they're just so common in the Southwest and even when you get up to Colorado. But here I was really surprised because I thought, okay, maybe I can get a permit and have a few in the lab. And after counting them, I was like, no, I can't. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not for this group. So that really surprised me. Yeah, I did a video on uh, the Hensi and mentioned that they were in Missouri and the comments were just full of people like, I've lived in Missouri my entire life. I've never seen one. <laughs> it's like, yep. they're there. I mean, it's just be <laughs> in very rural uh, areas. But yeah, it, it's, it's kind of, I, I always find it interesting um, when you're looking at tarantulas because you, you got people like in Arizona, uh, especially in Colorado during breeding season, like they're complaining about the amount of especially <laughs> male tarantulas that are walking around. But then there are other areas, it's like, they're they're almost uh, extinct. Probably not the right word, but they're just they're not available in that. Like the, the species is thriving elsewhere, but not somewhere where they used to be a lot of. And I always yeah. wondered if it's if it's because of human encroachment on their area, or if it's something uh, if there's an issue with some of the chemicals. Like St. Louis is a big city. There's probably a, a lot of carbon emissions from just factories and cars and stuff like that. But also a lot of people using insecticides and pesticides and, and stuff on crops and, and totally and on the side of the road, uh, not even to mention chemical plants that are just, you know, dumping stuff in the, uh, into the water table or, you know, the, the, the rivers and stuff. I mean, is there any correlation between uh, the human activity just poisoning, poisoning them, poisoning them? I can't speak today. Yeah. I, that's a question that I actually, I have no idea the type of data I've been collecting can't answer that. So I'm not sure. I know that's definitely been an issue with lots of other invertebrate animals. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. That's one I just don't know. Uh, just something I, I was kind of curious about. Uh, I figured if anyone would know, you might. <laughs> Uh, what can someone like me or somebody listening to this podcast that loves tarantulas and is very interested in tarantula behavior, like, is there anything they can do with the tarantulas in their own care that isn't going to be detrimental to them to kind of maybe do their own experiments to see if they can elicit some kind of behavioral response from their tarantula? Yeah. So one of the big things people can do, and right now there isn't like a nice central place to say, here's my tarantula data, is say you want to give them a ping pong ball and you've never done that before. And I know some folks have safety concerns like, oh, what if they get their fangs stuck? I've never seen that happen, but I know I'm just being forthcoming that people do have these safety concerns. But let's say you do give them a ping pong ball. If you have a ring camera or something else that could just film them all day, that would be really good to be able to see what they do with this object they've never seen before and you having data where you you can go back and film it. The other might be filming feeding sessions over and over, especially if you get a new tarantula. So you can see what they're doing over time and you have that record. So filming, I'd say, is one of the big ways if you want to take data personally about your tarantula. I've thought about trying to start some kind of central repository where keepers could put information, but that is that is a really big project. That's not a small thing, especially with a massive amount of video data like that. But I would say for you personally, yeah, video is really, really good, especially if you're doing something new and looking at videos over a long period of time. Or just making notes. Maybe you don't have a good video set up to do that. Just say, what uh, what did your tarantula do when you tossed the cricket in that time? Or yeah. what happens when you do a dubia instead of, of a cricket? That kind of thing. So you can make your own notes. Um, it's just be consistent and do it over a long period of time. Yeah, it was something I, I noticed uh, with talking with some, some other people in the scientific community. Uh, you know, Asking them a similar question. Like, what can I do as a keeper? Like, because I've, I've noticed, you know, I, you can't blame people in science for not being uh, excited about people keeping them as pets. Like, I understand where they're coming from. I don't, I, I think that a lot, I think a lot of their opinion is based on misconceptions, uh, you know, that we just, you know, are a bunch of goth kids in our basement listen to heavy metal and want to keep a tarantula because it looks cool. Uh, you know, I, that may have been the case for a while, but I, I feel like now it's just kind of a negative stereotype. Most people that I know, Keeping tarantulas are, you know, they're very responsible. They're, you know, they're contributing members of society that, you know, have kids and 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 you would see them and, and they just look like a normal person. You wouldn't think they'd have 10 tarantulas on a shelf at home, but they're fascinated by them and they want to help. And I kind of 
got the feeling from some of the conversations I've had that it, it it's on us to kind of reach across the aisle, so to speak, to with the scientific community and, and kind of show them like, look, we're not just interested in getting them as many as we can as cheap as possible and pulling them out of the wild. Like we want to be part of captive breeding and we want to be part of conservation and we want to do what we can uh, to help with scientific research. And I, I know I was working with, um, uh, I don't even think I can still say who it was because I had to sign an NDA, but it was a zoo in, in the US where I would send them my male tarantulas that I wasn't going to breed so they could do their research on them. And you know they, they had offered to pay me and I was, and, and I mean, I could have definitely used the money, but I was like, I don't want to take the money away from your research. Like, I want this to be like an olive branch. Mm-hmm. Somebody from the pet hobby, so to speak, helping out somebody in the scientific community. And they were, they were very, kind, they were, you know, we established a good relationship, but then COVID happened and we kind of lost contact and I haven't spoken to them since, but I'm very interested to see whatever, you know, what came out of that and encourage other people to kind of do things like that. You know, some people are, they've told me they're sending molts to different students or universities awesome. uh, for like DNA testing and stuff like that. Some people have been sending dead specimens mm-hmm. or even just, uh, you know, alive, like just tarantulas, that, you know, especially male tarantulas that, you know, that, that have molted and sent them for research. Um, so I thought it would be cool. Uh, part of the, like when I started the tarantula collective, like the collective part had many meanings. Like uh, first and foremost, it was kind of just a Star Trek reference because I'm a huge Star Trek fan. And, uh, but it was also like, I, I wanted to kind of bring in both the hobby and the scientific community, the dealers and the keepers, you know, kind of bring everybody into like one central space. And that was one of the ideas I had was have a section of the website where people could just post. Um, because I was, I was noticing if I would tell us somebody that was in research, an experience I had, it, it, they just kind of labeled it as anecdotal. Like, well, that, that was your opinion, your perception. There's really no evidence to back it up. But I've noticed over the past couple of years, especially with some of them, the scientists I met on Twitter, they're really interested in photos and video. Like if, if I have a photo of a tarantula drinking, they're like, can I use that in my paper or whatever it is I'm doing? It's like, yeah. definitely. Like, you know, no charge. Just, just use it. That, that is awesome. Uh, at the American Arachnid Society, I believe. Mm-hmm. I, I had sent some photos for them to use and something they were doing. But it's like, yeah, I, I just, I feel like we have a huge source of data, at least. You know, with a bunch of people keeping them, doting over them, watching them all the time. If we could document some of this behavior and have it posted somewhere, then maybe that would be beneficial to people in research or... It really would. So like I've, I've been talking about the Texas Browns that I've been... Uh, measuring. So I found babies once in August and they were all in one tiny little place. And because tarantulas molt every year, it's really hard for me to measure their reproduction. Essentially. It's like, if I put a tag on one, they molt and then it's not tagged anymore. There's studies where people put little microchips in them, just like you do with your dog, but they have to bring them into the lab, let them heal, make sure they're okay. It's just much harder on the tarantula. So if I want to know population growth, for Texas Browns, I need to know how long does it take on average these spiders to mature? How many spiders are in egg sacs on average? So I can calculate population growth if I had that data. Where could I get it? Keepers and breeders. (laughs) So I think it would be really helpful. And as you were talking, I was thinking of something, and this might be a little more controversial, but it might be good if there was some kind of tarantula organization that wasn't associated with U.S. ARC that was specifically focused towards science or what we call citizen science, where lots of people who aren't scientists are contributing and helping. And it really wasn't associated with anything political or legislation. It might be more friendlier ground for all the groups to get together. But yeah, I know my research could definitely benefit from people's data that they're keeping at home. Yeah. I mean, because U.S. ARC is, is, it's the United States Association of Reptile Keepers for anybody that isn't aware, uh, but you should be. <laughs> but they, they do a lot of work as far as you know, lobbying on state, local, and even federal levels to protect the rights of pet keepers or exotic pet keepers. And I, I think initially it was just reptile keepers, but they've kind of broadened that scope to amphibians and uh, arachnids and vertebrates um, re- most recently. I think they also do some stuff with tropical fish and, and birds and yeah, they they are. It might. I mean, they. I know. I, I've talked to them many times. Phil seems like a really nice guy. He's really passionate. But I also know he is. He is 
the U.S. arc in general is not looked on fondly by some people in in both like the PETA animal rights people, but also some researchers, people in the scientific field, because they kind of feel like you you just want to keep these as pets. And so so I understand there being a little bit of pushback there. So I think that would be that would be cool to have. Like the, for a while there was I don't know I know there's the British Tarantula Society. Yeah, the, used to be an American Tarantula Society. I mean I think it's still there. I just don't, they don't seem very active. I think I saw yeah. a couple of years ago they had a conference, but I haven't seen anything recently. And their website kind of is, it doesn't look like a society website. It has other information on it. And I guess I only brought up U.S. Art because that was like the only sort of national American organization I could think of that had kind of an umbrella for, with tarantula yeah. keepers. But their mission, I think, would be, it, it's different. It would be great to have one that's just like, for the hobbyists, we're not doing the political stuff, we're doing the science thing. So, I agree. I think yeah. That would be very cool to just kind of not have anything to do with the politics of importing and exporting and, and keeping and all that. So just focus on statistics and, and you know growth rates and you know just how different species uh, act in captivity and behavior. I think that would be very fascinating. And I think there's a lot of people out there probably listening to this podcast that would be on board <laughs> with something like that. You know, because it, it, you're you're watching them anyways. You're tracking. At least I am. I don't know. I, we track our feedings here. Uh, or I, I, we, I don't know. <laughs> sometimes I refer to myself in that royal we, but I've got another guy here. I hired someone recently. He's a zoology student at the local university. Nice. And, uh, he was, he helps me just kind of maintain, yeah, he helps me with feeding and watering, but it's, it's fascinating because he has a completely different outlook on it than I do. You know what I mean? We both have a passion for reptiles and arachnids. And, uh, you know, his, his main thing, I guess, because of the, just what classes he's taken, it seems I should have him on the podcast and let him talk about it, but he focuses more on reptiles, but he's really interested in arachnids. So it, it was kind of a, like a nice crossover. Like he could get experience. Uh, cause I know part of his zoology degree, like what he was telling me is that he has to go, uh, like he has classes that are just taking care of large collections. So this mm-hmm. was like a good way for him to do that, but with arachnids, not reptiles. And we've got a small local zoo here. He works at as well, but. It's nice because I can share with him everything I've learned over the past couple of decades, uh, but he also has knowledge of things that I'm completely unaware of that he's learned in school. He's learned from working at zoos and, and with some of these professors and, you know, can kind of, you know, give me some information. So it, it, it's, a, it's a cool little thing we got working on. So now when I say we, I'm referring to Zach. <laughs> so I, wish he, awesome. I wish I could have him here every day. Like just, just uh, quit all your other jobs and just work for me, but not, not there yet. Can't quite afford that. <laughs> I would have loved that when I was an undergraduate. That sounds great. Yeah, it's fun. He's a nice guy. He helps me film and like wrangle tarantulas and stuff. And yeah, we have some, some really cool conversations. So I, I think it would be cool if, but I don't know who 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 would set something like that up. Like I, I don't have time. I would love to do it. <laughs> I, I can barely do what I'm doing right now. Like how would someone go about setting up a repository or a website or something? for people to submit this information in a way that the scientific community would have any interest in it? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple good model kind of programs. One of them would be iNaturalist. So you might be familiar with that where people post wild sightings and they can include all this data with it. So iNaturalist is actually open source. So that's a database system if you're a good software database person that you could adapt. Um, there's also a couple other really great model programs with dogs. So the dog aging problem, or wait, the dog aging project, and what's the other one called? Darwin's Ark, I think, that have initiated the same kind of thing just with pet dogs. So behavior surveys, they'll take in genetic samples, and they just kind of coordinate it. And this is a data set that they curate that other scientists can get access to. So those are two models that work really, really well. So if if this were something I were going to start, and I also don't have time to to do, I could help with something a little bit, but I couldn't like lead the whole thing. Right. It would be to get a few passionate people together that can split up and work on different tasks and really getting tech people together. Mm-hmm. Because you need to be able to, the database is the problem, right? Where does all this data live? How do we make sure it's formatted correctly? And that kind of thing. So getting those tech people would be one. And the other would be a funding stream that could pay for data hosting services, especially if there's a lot of photos and video. Mm -hmm. So those, I think, would be the big things that people need to work on. So if it were me, I'd get people with interest time, even better if someone has a little money, form a 5013C nonprofit, 
um, and start applying for grants and working on that technical back end before launching it and get, collecting data from keepers. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're listening to this right now and you have any interest in and you're an organized person or you have some grant writing experience or you just, you're a technical kind of computer whiz and can build apps and websites and stuff like that, you know, send me an email that tell me you're interested. Maybe we can, I can try and get a, a group of people together. Um, you know, cause I, I, I can barely do my own website, <laughs> let alone build an app, but I've learned over the past, you know, however many years since I've been doing this, that I don't have to do everything myself. Like, yeah. and it's something like I'm kind of sometimes a control freak, but I've, I've, I'm learning to delegate to people that are passionate and have experience that I don't have and just be like, all right, you do this thing. Like for a long time, I wanted to build my own app for tracking feedings and things like that because mm-hmm. I just didn't feel like there was anything good out there and kept pushing it back. Like, well, I'm going to have to learn how to build an app. So, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, and then we'll and then I realized there's people out there already doing this. They already have the experience. They just need the help in promoting it or getting funding or things. And I was like, that I can do is I can partner with these people. And that's kind of what I did with arachnophiles. Like I had mentioned, that was something I wanted to do. And then I get an email. I was like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Maybe you could just help me. And I'm like, definitely. And so, you know, so I'm, I mentioned them every chance I get, like right now, uh, arachnophiles.com, get a free app on the Apple Play Store or, or uh, wait, Apple Store or the Play. Google Play, whatever. I'm not good at this, but uh, you can download it for free and you can track, you can post pictures of your tarantulas on there, track their feeding, track their growth rate, even like make notes about their behavior and stuff like that. And I, I think it would be really cool if we could get a group of people together to kind of have, start making this repository. I yeah. know we can take the meta, metadata from arachnophiles. There's also a JOM, J O M. Uh, it's another app similar. I, you know, he seems like a really nice guy. We keep, trying to have a conversation and our schedules just never line up, but hopefully he'll be on the podcast this season and, and I'll ask him about that. But maybe we could just get the metadata from all of these feeding apps that people are using to track and just kind of, you know, have that, you know, uh, as, a, as a good base. And then other people can submit other information and video clips about behavior. And I just think yep. it would be really fascinating, even if the scientific community doesn't want to touch it. I just think as a keeper, people that are interested in tarantulas, it would be kind of be cool to... I think they might... <laughs> And I think there's ways to expand it even after that behavior and feeding data. Like that's that's the low hanging fruit. Like get that people are already doing that. But I think one thing that could be super helpful is as we identify more tarantula populations that are in trouble, being able to move breeding males around the country and know their pedigrees would be really helpful. I know if I were running a zoo breeding program, I would have a hard time taking in um, a pet hobby male because I wouldn't a lot of times I wouldn't be able to know exactly where he came from. So I don't know if I'm breeding a really closely related animal. Am I maintaining good genetic diversity? Is it even the same species in some cases? So that would be like the stretch goal. I know I'm just like off to the races here. This is (laughs) far in left field, but I'd love to see an actual organized pedigree database so that people doing conservation-based breeding could more easily get the spiders that they need, move them around legally, um, to maintain high genetic diversity in captive populations and avoiding hybridization. So that, that'd that be another thing I'd love to see. That's something we actually talked about, uh, and I can't remember who it was, but we talked about on the, like one of the first podcasts I did, like in that first season, I had, I had some, I wish I could remember who I was talking to. Her name is on the tip of my tongue and I just can't think of it. She's probably listening and yelling. <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember my name. A very, very fascinating young lady. But that was, I believe that was who I was talking to when we were discussing the issue with hybridization in the pet hobby and how, you know, like, like I've got some post Lotharias back here, uh, like the Ornata, it's an endangered species. It wasn't when I got it as a spiderling, however many years ago, but it's like I had had it for a few years and then, you know, it got, it got moved over uh, on that ESA list. And I, and I kind of felt guilty, like if that makes sense, like I am keeping this thing as a pet. It's a you know, full grown female. She looks great and she's endangered. Like her species is endangered. I want to do what I can. Like, should I donate it to a zoo or to some kind of mm-hmm. conservation for breeding? And and pretty much was shot. Like, we have no way of knowing if that's purebred, if that's you know genetically pure. It could be a hybrid, in which case we're not interested in it because we can't reintroduce those into the wild if we breed them. And right. I was, how can we do? And that was like, at, at, when that was going on, just kind of give you an idea of the time frame. That's when like Bitcoin was blowing up, and everybody was all about <laughs> cryptocurrencies. And they were they were coming out with well now I guess they're they're called NFT tokens I don't remember what they were called back then but it, it was maybe that's what they were called but I feel like there was a different name or there was one like one of them available but it was mm-hmm. essentially a, a token like a, a cryptocurrency they were using it to track food 
So uh, like some of them would be grown in, uh, I don't know, Africa, we'll say. There's uh, some fruit that was grown and they would um, attach this non-fungible token to it that would get updated. So like when you bought it at the grocery store, you would be able to scan and see this is where it was grown. These were the conditions. These were the chemicals that were used as fertilizers or insecticides or whatever. This is how it was transported. This is where it was stored. Yep. You know, like the whole history. And you, you can't go back and, and make any changes. And I was like, why can't we do that with tarantulas? So if I breed a tarantula, I could, you know, kind of generate these coins that are attached to them and will go with them wherever they go. So if I sell, you know, sell it to somebody, then I would also have this, this token that would go with it and that they would be able to see this spider was bred by this person on this date and these were their two parents and those parents would have their own token that would trace back that lineage but it's like you can't really go back in time so we would just have to start it right now yeah moving forward so it would take years decades before there was like a really good database and everything was tracked and, and you could trace back i think you could take your idea with the database because you have to have that component that where you can get new data, but you can't go backwards and alter data without a lot of work anyway. But there's one other thing that I think could take that decade off the shave that off. And that's um, genetic barcoding. And I think we talked about this briefly in Facebook messenger, but in genetic barcoding, that's where scientists find a bit of DNA, maybe on nuclear genome, maybe on, maybe on mitochondrial, but basically they find a good chunk of DNA that acts like a species barcode. So if we could figure out those barcodes for tarantulas, just that's one piece of DNA, it becomes much cheaper to analyze. And if you do a good job, you can start to say, okay, that's a hybrid, that isn't. This came from this part of the world, this one came from over here. And that's something where people sending molts in or um, people that are legally importing say, yeah, this is exactly where this tarantula came from. Here you go, have my molt. That that could take some time off your idea there so that that starting the pedigrees now and going forward, we can start to truth those pedigrees. So I think, I think you're onto something. Well, you bring up an interesting point. It's something I, I was researching for a video a while back and uh, I don't even remember what video it was, but I was looking for information on essentially like the, the genetic testing or like doing a DNA test on your tarantula. I think it was more focused on determining a species because there's some like Pamphibita species, some Tilicotal or Brachypelmas, they look very similar, yep. uh, like, like the Homori and the Smithy. Or, you know, uh, there's all these different Pamphibita species that are almost locale. Like they, that's how they're, they're differentiated between, more mm -hmm. so than any kind of genetic or, you know, I'm, I'm like, w is this, what, what species is this? And they're like, I don't know, where, yeah. wherever. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell just by looking at it or even really good photos. Like, it all depends on where it was collected and what it was sold to you as. So it's like if your labels fall off your enclosure, which is something that's happened to me, <laughs> a couple of Pamphibetus, it's like, oh, I don't know if that's Vespertinus or you know which one that is because the labels kind of got messed up or I rehoused mm -hmm. it and put the label over right away or something like that. And, you know, shot myself in the foot. <laughs> but it's like, uh, and when I was looking at the DNA testing, some of them, and this was like, I don't know how long ago this was, so it may have changed, but they were, one, it was expensive. And two, a lot of the, like the only way they could get really good DNA is from a deceased specimen. Like they weren't able to pull enough DNA from a molt. Is right. that still the case? Or, I mean, has that? So I am about to find out. <laughs> so the genetic studies I found before for wild spiders, uh, they basically would go out in the wild, catch them, and they would pull off a foot. And then the genetics they were doing on that foot were, you didn't need a lot of great DNA. You could de deal with a smaller sample. So I am working to see if I can first replicate that, but then get a whole, um, and this is going to sound like genetic gibberish, but a whole mitochondrial genome. That's the second thing I'd like to do is to see if I can use molts to get that. Um, I think your captive tarantulas, you're going to have better luck because you can get a molt right after it's fresh and you can throw it in the freezer. So the DNA doesn't have as much time to degrade. So it's going to be challenging. I might not be able to do it, but I'm really hopeful so that, like you said, we're not waiting for tarantulas to die. And also we're not pulling off their toes. Yeah. Obviously, if they are kept nicely, they can molt and, and be fine after losing a toe. But I, I would just, just as well avoid doing that. So I am about to find out. So we actually were incubating, me and some other students, some molts last night, trying to get the DNA out of them. 
Um, I have another student that's probably processing some right now as we speak, and I'm going to go see later how much DNA we got out of there. But then comes like quality control. Cool. We got DNA. Is it actually good enough to do the things we want to do? So yeah, that's a, you were worried about dumb questions. That's a very smart question. Is this molt DNA good enough to do this? Like, I think it would be cool if we had like a 23andMe or like an Mm ancestry.com situation with tarantulas where I could, as soon as it molts, I could take that, ship it off to somebody and they could, you know, be like, well, this is the exact species that we think it is. Or, uh, or even more like you you trace back, well, you know, that it came Mm -hmm. from this specific area based on, but I mean, I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know how specific DNA would get uh, between species, but yeah, yeah, like from a lot of the research that I've done, especially I think it was uh, when I was researching the Gramostola pulchra. I think that was the the video uh, where I ran into this because there was they were having issues breeding pulchras in captivity, and then somebody kind of had the realization: well, some of them were collected in um, Brazil, and some were collected in Argentina, and some were collected in Chile. I think those are the three countries. Who were like, and their location is like where those three countries meet. And they're separated by rivers. So even though they look identical over thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions yes. of years, they were separated uh, for a long enough time to develop genetically uh, uh, um, um, different enough they couldn't crossbreed. Right. Uh, that sense. Uh, or at least that's the theory. Yeah. No, that's totally following all my ecology and evolution classes. That's a thing that can happen. <laughs> they were like, we, we don't know because the only way that we can do this is we have to have deceased specimens to get enough of the type right. of DNA that we need to, to make this. And, and that's just not something. And who wants to kill their tarantula to get the DNA? It's not, you know. So uh, if, if you're able to, like if, if what you're doing right now with the DNA uh, mm-hmm. with molds is successful, would there ever be some kind of situation where... Like, I mean, I get hundreds of molts a year, like where I would be able to package them and label them and send them to someone like you to create a database? Or is that something that there would really be no need for in the scientific community? So they wouldn't want to fund something like that? Hard maybe. So let's assume the DNA is high enough quality. So each of each of us humans, just really quick, have uh, two genomes. We have the nuclear genome, which is in the nucleus of your cell, and the mitochondrial genome, which is genome in the mitochondria. So I'm looking for mitochondrial genome, and that's much, much smaller. You need, and it's usually more robust if you have kind of crappy samples. And in other species, that has worked for this barcoding thing I'm talking about, where you're like, yes, it's this species, no, it's that species. But so if someone, me or someone else, because I'm a genetics newbie, I'm just learning all this stuff, yeah. were able to develop that, possibly you could have a situation where folks could send uh, something in. There's a reptile guy who has a private company. What is it called? Might be Rare Genetics is the company. Um, that's They seem to be trying to start a similar thing with snakes. So that might be someone to reach out to. And then lastly, what you're talking about in terms of scientists being interested. So there's a big database called GenBank and it pulls in basically any DNA data people get or mitochondrial DNA or RNA. They all dump it in this database and it connects, I think, American databases, European, and then maybe Japan. And I'm sure there's others. So if I left a country out, I'm sorry, or a whole region of the world out, I'm sorry. Uh, but everyone dumps it in there. So I can go find some tarantula DNA and get the sequences and download them and, and do analyses and things. So that infrastructure already exists. Are you saying maybe sometime in the future there will be an opportunity for people to submit these things for testing? Possible. Just, you know, like, or like donate them, I guess, kind of? It's possible. It depends if you had someone with the interest, again, the money. It's always going to come back to the money to be able to start maintaining that kind of database or an organization could do it because there's private DNA sequencing companies that might be willing to lend a hand provided you had some funding, say, here's our goal. Do you think you can do it with these tissue samples Mm -hmm. and they can try? So I think it's within the realm of possibility. You're just going to have to have the right people, the right time and the right amount of money. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's something I've, I've, I uh, kind of found is frustrating to deal with um, with any community, really, but like, but particularly the tarantula community. It kind of seems like we're we've got a lot of passion for the spiders. Uh, we want to give them the best possible life. We want to learn about as much as we can from them. But when it comes to money, 
would I want to spend my dollar on research and you know developing knowledge for future generations to benefit tarantulas on a whole, or would I want to use that money to buy a new tarantula? It, it, people always want to buy the new tarantula. You know? <laughs> so I mean, I, I'm not saying, I'm not judging anybody because I, I I could be the same way, <laughs> but it's like you know, it, it's like it, it's it's frustrating. You know, it's like when it comes down to just money, it's like, well, that's that's a pretty serious roadblock because people don't want to separate with their hard earned money, especially when they could spend that to get the new tarantula they want or some new enclosure or buy food. <laughs> you know, yeah. family. It's- the way dog people do it is they have, I don't know if you're into dogs or dog breeding, but they have breed clubs and some, and they people pay dues to be in the club and then. Some of the club dues or any events they put on, a percentage of that goes back into a fund and they will fund research, especially genetic health research for different mm-hmm. dog breeds. So I don't know if there's like a club model that could work. What do you think? Yeah, I think that would that would be pretty cool. Uh, there was uh, years ago, a couple of years, three years, I don't know. My time frame since COVID has been so screwed. <laughs> it could have been a couple of years ago and it could have been six years ago. I don't know. But it was the Tarantula Keepers Coalition that they kind of put together and that was one of the things they were they were they were wanting to buy some land in Sri Lanka to kind of turn it into a awesome. conservation area. They were also going to be sending money to some scientists mm-hmm. over there working with them, and it seemed like a really good thing. But like a lot of stuff, especially I mean, just I mean a lot of stuff anywhere, <laughs> it got mired in politics and who was on the board, who wasn't on the board, uh, where is the money being spent, and. I mean, I got caught up in it and and based on some of the people that were on the board, it's like, I don't want to get involved with them because for one reason, I'm not going to get into all the drama of it. But looking back, I mean, I don't even think it's around anymore. I think it just dissolved just because they got a lot of support, but then all that other drama happened and, and people just kind of fell off. But I think they, maybe they didn't go about it in the best way, uh, but I think that their head was in the right place as far as trying to get the tarantula community involved in raising money because they were having raffles. They had, people were donating tarantulas. Different dealers were donating tarantulas. Mm-hmm. They were raffling off and that money was going into a fund to support research uh, or you know a lot of cool things. So I think if something like that could be created, that would be great. Uh, maybe just not by people that have a financial interest in it. I think that was the biggest issue is that a lot of the people that were on the board were breeders and dealers. You know, So it was kind of like, you know, I think it would be better if there were a lot more people that didn't financially rely on it. Like even me, I, I have a financial stake in the tarantula hobby. So maybe I wouldn't even be the best person to do that. But somebody that, you know, could could stand there and be like, I'm not doing this to make money or to better my own business in any way, I think would be a, a, a lot more effective and probably not fall victim to some of the politics that can get involved. I see what you're saying. That makes sense to me, just in terms of what I know about nonprofit management. Yeah. I mean, because I think that was, I think they were a 501c3, but they weren't I don't know. That was part of the issue is they were just like out of New York, even though nobody lived in New York. <laughs> it wasn't like a federally. Oh. <laughs> it, was a, it was a 501c3 in that state. It wasn't like federally recognized or something. So some people are like, oh, okay. it's a scam, but I, I don't know. I don't know much about that kind of stuff. But I think it would be very, it'd be a very cool idea if somebody else could pick up that banner that it didn't have a, a financial interest in, in that. Because I, I mean, even for me, like it would, it would sway my opinions on stuff, uh, you know? So I, I, I think somebody that's a little more yeah, I don't. I don't even know the right word. I don't know. I don't know who. I think it'd be something that needs to be done. I just don't know who would be the best to do that. I guess. Yeah, someone that doesn't maybe doesn't have a conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. I mean, so. you come to mind. I think you would. <laughs> <laughs> you both. Yeah. You keep some, but you're also studying them scientifically. So I mean, that's the best of both worlds. But I'm sure you're also way too busy to do something. <laughs> Definitely very busy. Though I was telling my husband the other day, I'm like, man, when I'm all done with this, I can't think of a job where anyone would pay me to keep doing the tarantula conservation work. And that's been really, really fun. So I was sort of lamenting <laughs> that I probably have to stop when I'm done. How much time do you have? Um, grad students are known for working <laughs> over 40 hour weeks and things like that. So at the, t- at the moment, not as much time as I would like, but who knows, maybe during that transition period. Um, yeah. I think the thing maybe would be like we were talking about before with the citizen science project where people bringing in data, maybe starting really small and just letting it build over time. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe there's some big goals of having a big like association where we're keeping pedigrees and doing genetic data and buying land in Sri Lanka and all that cool stuff. But mm-hmm. maybe it's the sort of thing that it just starts small. And so there's more 
time for people like me or other interested folks to to get it going. Well, let's just suspend reality for a second. We're just going <laughs> to speak completely hypothetical and just in my mind, uh, based on my dreams. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, uh, I don't feel obligated or uh, like I'm going to hold you to this or anything like that. But <laughs> one of the things I would like to do, and again, 100% spec, just dreams. <laughs> it's just my dream. But if at some point, what I'm doing became as successful as someone like, uh, I, I don't know, like um, Brian Barczyk and like he's, he's got his reptarium and he, he sells, you know, he breeds snakes and he's selling them on his website and he has this like uh, this is aquarium that he's built out and the zoo and all this kind of stuff. Snake Discovery is another, you know, they started as a content creator. Now they have the very cool zoo and store. I personally dislike retail. So I have no interest in opening up a store or breeding tarantulas or anything like that. But if what I do ever became as successful and as popular as you know the followings those people have, instead of getting into breeding tarantulas and stuff like that, I would like to go kind of the other way into conservation and uh, research and stuff like that. And, and kind of like, it, again, to try to bridge that gap. So I mean, I think it'd be really cool instead of investing the money in a space to have a zoo or a space to do breeding projects and and carry inventory to sell. Mm-hmm. Use the money that would have been invested in that to invest in hiring someone like you to continue conservation work and stuff like that. So maybe in the future we could work something out. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, if I had if I won the lottery or something like that and could just make myself a little endowment fund that spits out money every year. Yeah. Yeah, I could. Good way of looking at it. I mean, getting three million subscribers is kind of like getting the lottery. <laughs> I think that your odds are about the same, but it's a possibility. I never thought I'd get to. Well, I almost have one hundred and forty thousand subscribers now. I never thought I would ever get that many. So who knows what? Would happen. <laughs> but I think that would be that would be a, a cool thing to try. Yeah, and I think that would be kind of a cool foundation for a nonprofit as well to have content creators, like you said, go the other way. Say, okay, we're going to focus on conservation now for these creatures that everybody loves. Yeah. That'd be really cool. I think uh, that's kind of something cool. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Ants Canada, but yeah, you know, he's he's got a great YouTube channel. He's got millions of subscribers, and he kind of took some of his money that he has made and bought just <clears throat> acres and acres of jungle, and it's like a, an ant conservation now. He's got all you know, he goes out so there, cool. he makes a bunch of cool videos about ants. He keeps them in you know all these cool elaborate enclosures in his house, but. Now he has you know a big fancy house, but now he can go out back and there's just acres of land that nobody can develop or you know he owns it and he's keeping it raw and natural and you know goes out and, and has some really cool species of ants that are able to thrive there, not to worry about pesticides or you know just stuff getting destroyed to build buildings. Like it's it's kind of and it, I think that's kind of where my inspiration. Like I don't want to go live in a jungle or anything, but <laughs> you know, it would be cool to be able to to you know just get a, a concert, a tarantula conservation going, even if it was just somewhere in Arizona or something like that. No. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of stuff you could do in North America and, and extend out. I'm going to have to look him up. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he's a really nice guy. Um, I got to meet him at animal con. That was kind of cool. And I felt bad because <laughs> he also does some tarantula content. Sometimes mm-hmm. he keeps other animals and he had posted a video a few years ago about the, he had got a post Letharia metallica and he didn't breed it and he had it for a while and then it produced an egg sac. And he was uh, was kind of like suggesting that maybe it was um, parthenogenic. Mm -hmm. And there is no evidence that that species is parthenogenic. But I found it interesting. And then I was like looking into it and I was like, well, based on where you live, uh, I think he's in the Philippines, I believe, or something like, well, yeah, I think he's in the Philippines. But it just just seemed a lot more likely that he was either wild caught and sold or it was bred and produced babies and maybe double clutched or something. They didn't think it was going to produce another sack and sold it as an adult female. And then she like re-inseminated herself or however that works. And mm-hmm. so I made a video kind of being like, you know, I, there's no evidence that the species or even any spider in this genus has ever shown any parthenogenic. Or I don't even think any tarantula has ever had. Like that's more of a thing for scorpions. Yes. Or some species do. But I, I don't remember hearing. Uh, and, but even in the video, he didn't say 100% that's what happened. He was just like, I bought this. They told me it was it was captive bred. It was not wild caught. I'm like, people mm-hmm. lie all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or, you know, maybe it could have been bred. But anyways, I made a video kind of debunking it. And, and mm-hmm. I think I had maybe 40,000 subscribers at the time. And he had a couple million. So I never thought that he would ever watch it. And then like months after I had uploaded, he left a comment. It was like, interesting video. And I was just like, oh, crap. <laughs> <He wasn't. laughs> but then I met him. 
uh, at Animal Con. And I think it was uh, first he said hello, and we kind of introduced to each other. And then, like, the first thing out of his mouth after that was, I didn't really think it was a part of the situation. <laughs> That was just kind of debate people in on the, on the film. Like, you're probably right. It probably was bred in captivity and just produced an extra egg sack. Well, like, there you both a, benefited. It's like, it's not a very exciting content. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it, man. It was, it was like mad at you or anything. But it was just, it, it was, it was awkward. It kind of gave me that, be careful what you say about people online because eventually you might meet them in person. Uh, but I, I wasn't trolling. I just was like, I don't think that's right. <laughs> saying that, putting out that kind of information. But I've been guilty of saying things myself that ended up not being true. So you said that you, you're keeping tarantulas. Like, so I guess, and I know we're, we're running out of time, but I, I'm curious, uh, you're keep, you have, you said five tarantulas? I think it was five. I have to count in my head. <laughs> so did um, you keep tarantulas and then get into studying them academically? Or were you studying them academically and then just started keeping them as pets? So I started keeping them first, um, but I was always interested in invertebrate behavior and welfare way before my first tarantula. I'm just very interested in how we look at behavior in animals that don't behave like we do or even look anything like we do. Yeah, so I got my first tarantula. I was at a conference I don't know if you've ever been to this. It's the, oh, it's IECC, Invertebrates for Education, Conservation, and, and something else. But they meet in Tucson, Arizona every year. And it's awesome because you just, everyone stays at the same place, same hotel. You pop outside and people have headlamps on and they're looking for bugs and things. So you can just That's jump sounds- in with a group. But they had a few vendors there. So I picked up a Chalcotes and a baby Pamphobatus Machala. And without knowing a ton, but I knew I, I'm like, I know I can figure out the husbandry for these things. And I did. And I remember sitting there with my little vial and someone who knew a lot more said that little, that pemphibatus is going to grow really fast. (laughs) And she did. She's huge (laughs) now. She's a big gnarly spider. Um, So I started keeping them then. The Chalcotes, I didn't, I just picked the like biggest spider I could find. And in this case turned out to be a male. So like a year and a half later, he hooked out and I was like, oh, Sorry, buddy. Bye. So I had to learn about that. And it was after that that I started thinking like, well, there's a lot of tarantulas kept in captivity, whether it's zoos or hobbyist keepers or what have you. And I really want to know more about how we measure their welfare, how we know how they're doing, because there's just such a strange species. So that's what got me into coming back and doing my PhD and trying to integrate them into my research somehow. Tell me the name of that conference again, because I'd really like to, to drop in. Yeah, it's called IECC, and I, I can send you a, a link to it. Yeah. Um, and it's I got to say, it's mostly zoo folks that uh-huh. were there, um, but also some conservation and scientist folks. Uh, I took a, a workshop on building like fake logs and things for my enclosure out of different materials. That was a lot of fun. They had a, a pinning workshop, though I know not everyone's into to pinning. I know a lot of people taxidermy their spiders after they're dead. But mm-hmm. yeah, so that it's a really cool conference, um, super supportive of anybody into bugs. It's also not humongous, small to medium size. So Paul from uh, Bugs in Cyberspace, he moved down to like Sky Island area, which is, mm-hmm. and he invited me out. Again, this is one of those things like he moved there and we, I was going to, he invited me out to spend the weekend there. And film and make a cool video, and then COVID happened, and I could get a plane. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not driving to Arizona from the East Coast. <laughs> so once, and then you know, it 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 hasn't materialized. But at some point, I I'm going to take him up on that offer. And that was a thing. It's you fly into Tucson. So that, I mean, that would be cool to make a week out of it, like fly into Tucson, go spend the week there, and then go to a conference that weekend or something. Because <laughs> I'm sure he goes yeah. if he's living there. I bet he's going to that. Oh, I bet I bet he's heard of it. I I would be very surprised. But yeah, it's mostly zoo folks um, and some scientists scattered in there. But it's a ton of fun. Highly recommend. They also do field trips as part of the conference if you're looking for cool things to video. Have you heard of Sky Island Sky Island Adventures? I believe that's what he calls it. You know, I'm familiar with bugs in cyberspace, and I vaguely remember seeing something about like bug tours. And if you were doing that, Tucson is the place to do it. So yeah, I'm not surprised. He and, um, <laughs> just shapes in nature. I mean, they just, they bought, I don't even know, uh, it just looked like a, like a lot of acres of land. And he's got a house and then he has a guest house. That's so, so cool. It's like, a, he calls it a bed bug and breakfast. You say it too fast. It kind of sounds like a bed bug breakfast. Like That does not sound as cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got like this little guest house and you, you get a group of people together and you know, you rent it out for the weekend or whatever. And, and if I'm, and I don't want to like misquote him. So, don't take this uh, too 
too seriously. I may be saying things that he doesn't offer anymore or never offered, but from what I remember, the way he was pitching it is, you know, he, he, he serves you breakfast and then you get in the vans or whatever and he takes you out to the desert and you, depending on if you want to see insects or you want to see arachnids or you want to see reptiles or whatever it is, he knows the, the best areas to find those and you go just herping all day or, you know, turning over logs and rocks looking for cool spiders and tarantulas and, you know, all kinds of fascinating stuff. And there's like a, uh, some bats in this, like there's a cave which just has hundreds of thousands of bats. You can go check that out. And, and you, know, you come back and you eat dinner. And then once the, the sun sets, they set up like one of those uh, UV lights on a sheet and it attracts all kinds of crazy insects. And it just looks, I mean, if you're into bugs and reptiles, like that's a cool little vacation. You know, he, he serves you at least two meals a day, a place to stay, transportation and, you know, tours of wildlife. And I was like, that's, that's the job to have right there. Yeah, I was say, that doesn't sound like a bad gig. <laughs> Not at all. And I really want to go. Yeah, I think that would be awesome. So uh, last thing to wrap up here, um, just kind of like a, a parting word to uh, people that are listening that, you know, if, if they're listening at this point, they are apparently are, are pretty fascinated with what it is you're doing and what you have to say. Uh, you touched on this briefly, but is there something, not even something that could be uh, shared with others as scientific data, but just something somebody could do, uh, you know, maybe just a, a specific way of feeding them or interacting with their tarantulas that could possibly elicit some sort of behavioral response so they can see with their own eyes that, you know, maybe tarantulas are a little bit more intelligent than we have been giving them credit for the past few decades. Uh, I had Garrett from Reach Out Reptiles over and he was telling me one of the things, he had given me a, a bug-eyed African house snake and said one of the things that he does with his snakes that I should try doing and it, might, and it might work is anytime he goes to feed them, he takes the tongs and taps on the glass a few times and then will introduce the, uh, the mouse or you know, the rat or whatever it is for his snake. And it's gotten like over time, they kind of habituate to that to where if he wants to show them to somebody, he just has to take the tongs, tap it on the glass and usually the snake will come out of its hide or wherever it is if it's down in its burrow or whatever because it thinks, oh, there's food about to get introduced. I mean, could you do something like that with tarantulas or is there some other, like something similar to that that people could do to kind of get a habituated response? I think they could. And I, this is going to work best if you, say you have a tarantula that's already a good tong feeder. So you stick the tongs in, let the food go and they grab it immediately. That's kind of the prerequisite behavior. If you have a tarantula that's doing that, then you can start doing other things. I don't think anyone's done a great video on it. Maybe people think it's not useful. I don't know. But if you have a tarantula that's really good like that with tongue feeding, you could totally tap train them. So tapping on the top of the tank or on the side and then presenting the food item, trying to keep those two events close in time. Like you can't tap and then five minutes later put the cricket in. It has to be very close in time. I think you could probably do some tap training. And I'd love to see people who also have tarantulas that go for the water dish. If maybe if you tap train them, they're a little less, <laughs> maybe a little calmer. Um, yeah when you're working. So tap training is a good one. If you can tap train, one thing I'm trying to work on to see if target training is possible. And one thing you got to remember with tarantulas is their sensory experience is so, so different than ours. So can they even see the target I want to use? So I'm going to have to keep trying different things. So mm -hmm. vibrations are going to be good and smells are probably going to be good, but always be careful with smells because I know some people have had issues with essential oils. You don't want to just randomly introduce strong smells and chemicals. But yeah, I think vibrations and tap would be where I would start. And I would start with a tarantula that's already into tong feeding and then see yeah. if you can tap train them like a snake. That would be the thing. Yeah, you've inspired me with a, a couple of... Like I've been writing them down here. <laughs> but I, I think it's kind of... I got a couple of cool video ideas. Like one, I, I would really like to kind of replicate that experiment you were referring to with the the Y shaped, you know, trying to train them because yeah. that's something we could build here. I mean, I'm not going to like shock them or anything like that. But maybe <laughs> just have like, if you go down this path, there's food or something. If you go down this path, it's not, or there's a bright light at the end or something. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. A humane way of doing that. But, yeah, and I would just it would be cool to have video evidence, you know, to, to put out there. I think a lot of the problem, at least with content creators doing stuff like that, is just the amount of time it takes, you know, right. like shoot a video in a couple of days and edit it and upload it. And then, you know, you, you got a week before your next upload or sometimes just a few more days. Some people are doing it. Like I, I'm going to have to switch over to maybe two uploads a week, just <laughs> monetary. Like YouTube's <laughs> just not making as much money as it did you know, this time or like six months ago. It's just, it just, 
he just drops off. Like in you know, the first part of the year, you just don't get paid much and people aren't watching as much. So it just, you make about half as much money as you do in like in the, the summer and, and winter or the fall and winter. So I, I, I think that would be kind of cool. And I saw this guy, I don't even remember what channel it was, but he had did a uh, desert build for like just cool like scorpions and desert insects and stuff like that. And I was watching the video and I realized like this, he filmed this over like six months. You know what I mean? Like he planted yep. these plants and, and filmed them growing and then introduced one species at a time. And then that was just like the upload for the week was something that took him months and maybe a year to put together. And I'm like, I need to start working on stuff like that. Like, you know, it, it would take a lot longer. It'd be a lot more work, but I think it would be a lot more rewarding. Overall. Yeah. Well, and I can, I could send you, and I don't think sending individual papers, one that will, I don't think anyone would bother me about it. I could send you that paper. There's also another really good paper that's not about tarantulas at all, but it's good for training ideas. It's called how not to train your spider. And okay. it has a lot of stuff about how people train jumpers to do things. So that would also have good information. But like you said, you got to be patient. Like that paper, it took them a month <laughs> to, to train them up. <laughs> but yeah, I think that would be that would be really cool. Even though it wouldn't be groundbreaking, the stuff that's already been researched and, and documented, I, I think it would be cool for just to have it accessible for free on YouTube. People can see like this is what was done and this is... This is and see, just see if I could replicate the results uh, or maybe change it a little bit. I think that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there anything else you wanted to say before you know we wrap things up? Yeah, I guess it would be that welfare matters. We know that they have brains and they can learn. They're not going to be a brainiac like your border collie or anything like that, but they can learn. And what you do matters for their welfare. And then the second thing I would say is even with our local North American species, our Afona Palma, by captive, I was super surprised to see how small our Missouri populations were. So I definitely want to plug that if you're a hobby keeper. Get your captive breads. We, we plug that a lot on this channel. <laughs> All about the captive breads. Uh, so if, if somebody wanted to, I mean, I don't even know if this is, this is something that you could do, but I mean, if somebody wanted to help you in your research, like is is there any way they could contact you if they had molts or specimens they wanted to donate or anything like that? I mean, is there a way to get in contact with you? Yeah, I'd be happy to provide my email. I don't know if you want me to do that over audio here or just put it in comments or description. Put it down in the description, yeah. yeah. Nobody's going to write it down. They're probably driving. <laughs> yeah, so reaching out via email is totally fine. Um, at this point, if you send me a molt, I'm probably just going to put it in the freezer and be like, okay, sit there until I maybe have money or something to do with you. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to hoard your molts. But you know, maybe you're cool with that. The other would be is that if people want to financially support my research, we have an organization at University of Missouri St. Louis called the Whitney R. Harris Center for World Ecology. Um, and they have a donation link that you can use. You just would put in the description of your donation that this is for the tarantulas. And that helps us feed them, make more enclosures, fund some of this genetic stuff. So if people are interested in that, they could totally donate. Very cool. Uh, do you have, ever have any interaction with the St. Louis Zoo and then like their whole? Because they've, I, I was there recently with uh, Tarantula Cat and um, oh geez, who else was there with us? I think it was just Dave Kaufman. Oh, and Mo from Tarantula Cribs. We all went there one day. And Did you? I was impressed with the, the. I don't know what they call it insectarium or I don't know what what it was. Yeah. That, but it just had all kinds of cool spiders and arachnids and, and insects and. I just I was like, wow! I haven't seen a zoo that has a you know a display or a presentation on this level. That was that was very cool. Um, did you get to go in back, or were you just in the front? No, no, we we weren't that cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so St. Louis Zoo is super supportive of animal welfare research, and they're one of the partners with the the Harris Center, and they actually have a position. They have a lead researcher over there, so I do get to to talk with them and things. Nice. So there there are some really good zoos, and if you're really into like insectarium bugarium albuquerque biopark and albuquerque also has a really great bug zoo man you're really tempting me with these trips to the southwest <laughs> like new mexico arizona the, i mean that's where we went i we went to, uh, our honeymoon was in sedona that was our plan was once the kid graduates high school we were going to move to arizona <laughs> but uh, you know how life is so now we have a we may be adopting a four-year-old so <laughs> that may get put on hold until right. our 
fifties or sixties. We'll retire or so, <laughs> or we'll just take her with us. That's a great. I think running around in the Sonoran Desert sounds like a good way to grow up. Well, very cool. Thank you so much for being willing to come on. I know it was it was kind of a shot in the dark when I reached out to you. I was like, you know, most people are like, I don't want to. Like, I made a post on Facebook. I don't want to talk on camera, <laughs> especially with this amount of time. But you, you had a lot of really interesting things to say, and and you're really good at at relaying. Uh, your thoughts. So I, I, I have a feeling that people listening enjoyed this and found it as interesting as I did. So thank you for being willing to come on. Well, thank you for inviting me. I think um, it doesn't help tarantulas at all if scientists stay in ivory towers or they turn their nose up at talking with the keeper community. No one ever learned anything new by being shamed. So all we can do is come out and communicate and be good and show what we do. So I really appreciate you having me on. And no it was lovely can, to be interviewed by you. No one can learn anything by being shamed. I, I love that that's a yeah. that's a great sentiment to leave the leave the podcast on take that to heart people and and don't shame people online <laughs> well thank you so much and and good luck in all your research and i would love it if you'd be willing to come on again in the future like once you have done a lot of this research and, and you've got some results back maybe just to kind of discuss what it is you've learned and what worked and what didn't work if, if you'd be up for something like that yeah, I can give you a little updates. We got a few years left of what's going yeah. on. I'll probably have some of the genetic stuff done first, but yeah. Yeah, well, I have no plans on going anywhere. So even if it's five years down the road, we can definitely do that. Cool. Well, hopefully, I have no plans on going anywhere. I quit my job to do this. So, I mean, I, I would kind of... <laughs> I have to go back to work in retail or something, which we established I do not like. So, <laughs> all right. Well, this was great. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, there'll be links down below in the description for you know anything that we discussed during this podcast. So, if you want more information, check those links down below. I'll even link the the initial post that I saw on Facebook. Uh, and in that, if I remember right, that in that post you you cited your sources, right? You had links to those. Yeah, I put um, some of them, the links wouldn't do you any good because they're so old, but I put all the papers and where they were published and all that. It's all in that blog post. Thanks. So, yeah, yeah, check that out. Uh, get more information. And uh, you know, thanks again, Becky, for coming on. And hopefully we'll have you back on in the future. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anything like that, it definitely helps out if you you know leave a, leave a five-star review, uh, share it, all that stuff you got to do with social media and, and help get the podcast out to more people. And if you're watching on YouTube, you know, as always, like and subscribe. That, that always helps. And thank you all so much for uh, hanging out with us in the past couple of hours and, and enjoying this conversation. We will see you in the next podcast. Goodbye.